On this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hacker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino, we give you the latest transfer portal update for the Sooners. Then Josh McQuistian joins us to discuss OU's 2024 signing class, and we finish with our winners and losers of the week. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Thursday, December 21st, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of December, all you got to do is visit Riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now we're recording this on Thursday morning. Ted Lehman, how are we doing? Fantastic. We made it through signing day. No, no big issues. Not a whole lot of drama. Well, I mean, we've always got drama with with our fan base, but fairly, fairly easy signing day. I, uh, I'm with you. It was a lot of fun doing the signing day coverage. A lot of fun talking to the coaches about a lot of these guys. And just a reminder. If your business is interested in sponsoring the podcast in 2024, as OU enters the SEC, please reach out to us at the Oklahoma breakdown at gmail.com. And we will get you those sponsorship details. Let's jump right in it. We're going to talk the signing class with Josh McQuistion from sooner scoop, who does an awesome job talking to all these guys. He goes and sees them in person. He, he's got a great perspective on what this 2024 class is for Oklahoma. But, you know, we have to start it with portal updates. The portal giveth, the portal taketh. Bauer Sharp. What a name. Bauer Sharp, tight end from southeastern Louisiana. Guy used to be a QB. Been a tight end for a couple years. He commits to Oklahoma. Big and athletic. Ted, what, what do we think? What do we know about Bauer Sharp? Uh, I don't know a lot. I just know that the name sounds like you're supposed to say it all together. Bauer Sharp. Sounds you know? like a, sounds like a tech company. Bauer Sharp. <laughs> yeah. I work at Bauer Sharp. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. I like it. Um, don't know a lot about him. Measurables look good. Um, I, seems like a productive player and a guy that's ready for a step up in competition. Um, other than that, I, I really don't know a whole lot and, you know, we'll just have to see, hopefully he's a guy that comes in competes and, you know, can, can be uh, a guy that earns a spot rotational, whatever you want to say, but like, we, we, we've, we've got to have some bodies at that position and, you know, we, we got a recruit that's going to be coming in. That's, that's highly touted. So Hopefully this gives us some depth and some versatility moving into next season. The, I, I don't know if this is the right way to look at things or not. The fact that Utah wanted this guy with what they've been doing at the tight end position the last several years makes me feel better about it. Yeah. It, it just, it just does. If Kyle Whittingham wanted him, They've been they've been churning out some tight ends, so there there is that. But I was able to talk to a couple member of the staff, a couple members of the staff about him, and the word that kept coming up was versatility. Now I don't think, just from watching what I've watched, and you look at the stats he's put up, I don't think we're getting the next Travis Kelsey or anything like that. But I do think this is a guy that could fit in the Braden Willis. Uh, Blake Bell, remember when Blake moved to tight end his senior year, like that type of role. I think he can fit into that. A guy that can do a lot in line tight end, uh, be, be a guy that's off the ball 
and doing some of your split zone stuff, some of your insert stuff, like a combination of a inline tight end and a fullback. But he's got the athleticism to catch the ball in the flat, you know, catch it on some quicker routes and do something with it. And of course, guy can run down the seam. I mean, all all that type of stuff. But I view him more as like a do it, do it all type, almost like a throwback tight end. I think that people get more excited about the jumbo wide receiver type tight ends now. I, I don't think that's what Sharp is going to be. I think he's going to be more of a dirty work and get a touch here and there type of guy. But this team needs that guy. This team didn't have that type of player as, you know, as complimentary as we were of Stogner and, and what he did this season. He just didn't have, you know, he didn't have the speed you're looking for at the tight end spot. I think Sharp's got that, but I, I don't think he's going to be a big receiving threat. I think he's going to be more of a do a little bit of everything type of guy. Yeah. And it's interesting. I, what do you think the pecking order at tight end looks like when they go to spring ball? Oh my gosh. It's and I think Devon it, Mitchell's it, coming in early. I think he's an early arrival. Thank goodness. Uh, I think he immediately goes to TE one. I you look at him physically. Now, of course, you got to get him up to speed on the mental side of things, but you're not he's, giving he's six five, two forty five, two fifty, and that where he's listed. Yeah. And yeah. he was at a game this year, saw him in person. I was like, we need more guys that look like that guy. So he looks the part. He's he's definitely and he's got the physical build already where he looks like he's ready to play. You got to get him up get him up to speed on the system, but who in the tight end room are you gonna give reps over him? I, I don't know. That's, you need to get that guy ready to play. So I know I, that's kind of why I was asking. Is like, do we have if if Devon Mitchell is in fact coming? I have to check up on that. Um, I are those are those are your one A and one B coming in? I would assume you know, so. I know some guys on the on the roster right now will have something to say about that and. You know, it's going to be a big off season for a couple of those guys to to earn some of those spots. But the competition's about to ramp up there, tied in, and that's what we need. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I don't think anyone in the tied in room, none of those guys can have a complaint in the world if these two guys come in and are immediately getting first team reps. Yeah, but no one in that room has done anything. So, yeah, I think these two guys immediately come in and are getting the bulk of the first team and certainly the second team reps in spring practice. I, yeah, and I'm optimistic. I maybe too too optimistic, but I I am really thankful for what Stogner did this year, and it was not easy. He came in and played a ton of snaps. And the vast majority were at doing stuff that there's really not his specialty. Right. And he got way better as the year rolled on. I mean, I'm, I'm real thankful for what he did, but I, I feel like there's a chance that we are much better at the tight end position next season. I'm hopeful in that. We'll see. Have to be, have to be, have to be. All right, so that is the only portal addition for the Sooners. Uh, had a couple exits, a couple guys that have found landing spots. Uh, Savion Bird and Nate Anderson both headed to SMU. Now, remember, Savion went to Duncanville. Uh, Nate went to Ricky Reed, which is in Frisco. So both of these guys are going, you know, back home. They're going to be really close to home there for both of them. So wishing them the best. I. I will always wonder, you know, what happened with Savion Bird this season and, and why it just wasn't able to come together, but never really saw Nate be able to break through and get any playing time 
at all, despite being a really highly recruited guy. But wish both of them the best, man. Hope they play a ton of ball there for Rhett Lashley, who I think is a really good head coach. And I've heard really good things about they're heading to the ACC. So it feels like Lashley landing a couple guys that could maybe help you next season on your offense line feels like a good move for the pony. So it seems like he's building that roster in a good way, but yeah, we'll see what happens with both of those guys at SMU. Yeah. These the transfer portal, sometimes there's a shock and sometimes there's not a shock. I don't think either one of these shocked anyone. I guess maybe it did feel like Savion Bird may have been coming back to Oklahoma there at one point, but um, a I'm misleading you. Instagram post. Yeah. I, I hope because I think there's a ton of upside, just like, you know, everyone else. I hope that Savion Bird, a change of scenery, um, a, a different system, a different style, whatever it is, being closer to home, hopefully he finds whatever it was that was missing here. You know, he, he had some spectacular flashes. Hopefully he can find that and be consistent, go be a starter for SMU. And we know he's capable of it. Oh, completely agree. Is Marcus Stripling in the portal or not? Do we know? Because he put out a tweet with some pictures and the caption was, thank you, Oklahoma. It, it felt very transfer portally. Yeah. I don't, does he have eligibility? Does he have eligibility left? I don't know. See, it's too confusing, I, man. I, I don't know. I, it, know. Be, I was going through the comments and it felt like a good, bu- a goodbye post, but it was well, a weird time for a goodbye post. So is he in the portal? I, I yeah, don't know. I don't know. He's another guy that, you know, I think can play some ball somewhere for sure. Uh, he's got some, some real nice physical traits, uh, strong, quick off the edge. Um, I don't know. I wish you, they need to stop calling guys seniors. If they're, if they have more eligibility, like, I don't know what you, how you classify it, but if it says senior, I take that as you have no eligibility left. And that's just not the case anymore. What they should do is list how many years you have left, not how many years you've played. Yeah. Four years left. Right. Three years left, one year left if he's like a grad transfer. Just let us know how many years you have left. I don't need to know how many years you've been there. Just let me know how much eligibility, how many more seasons of college football can you play? We're counting down. We're not counting up. That's yeah, what we need. Like that. That's I what like we need. That. Now, the other portal news, Caden Green headed to Missouri. Now, something, a, a quote came out from Power Mizzou. I'm almost convinced he's single-handedly trying to turn OU Mizzou into a rivalry. Ted, you have known, what's the best way to do this? You have known Brent Venables for, what, 25 years now? Yeah. What would you like to say about Caden Green and some of the stuff he implied? I guess maybe is the best way to ask it. Yeah, so what was the quote? Um, the, the quote, quote was, I think the biggest thing was drink, the head coach. He's referring to Eli Drinkwitz there. He said, I think the biggest thing was drink, the head coach. He was honest. He didn't lie to me. He treats me like I'm a human and their program's on the rise. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, w- with that, there's obviously he's implying that he was lied to and wasn't treated like a human. Now you say a lot of things about coach Venables. He doesn't lie to you. Now, sometimes the brutal truth is not what you believe. Like what he's telling you, like what he believes is the honest truth to you may not be what your reality lines up with. That doesn't mean it's a lie, right? If anything, the, the Vittables 
and some of the reasons that he he rubs certain players the wrong way is because he does not sugarcoat. He does not deceive. He does not lead you along. You get the brutal, honest truth the entire time. So, I mean, that wouldn't that wouldn't align with what I know of him. And, and as you mentioned, I've known Coach Venables for a really long time. So, yeah, I don't I, I don't know, and I obviously don't know the details of their their private conversations. I don't really know how the whole thing went down. I just know what people have reported. And, you know, sometimes maybe that's near the truth, but it's probably not the whole truth. And honestly, um, two people, or I guess you could say multiple people from two opposing sides view aren't necessarily lying, but view the the way that everything went down differently. So you get these opposing clashing perspectives and everyone says, well, this guy's lying and that guy's lying. I think everyone probably just came away with it, came away from it with a uh, different feeling. But, you know, I, I, I guess I'm shocked at the way that all this has gone down. We see it in college football and there's usually you can see a guy on a roster or a guy in recruitment to where whatever the shenanigans end up being, it's really no surprise, right? You just, you knew it was coming at some point. That's the most shocking thing about this is I never would have, I never would have guessed this was going to go down with Caden Green. You know, I, I still don't have a whole lot to say other than I wish him the best. I think he's going to be a hell of a football player. I think he's going to play in the NFL. And I just, I don't want him to play well against us. Other than that, I think it's best we move on. And I'll also say that It's brought out the absolute worst in our fan base. And you're giving you're giving everyone in the country, every school in the country fuel when they recruit against you. And some of the stuff, and I don't know if it's true or not, but looking at it, if if people are going and putting negative reviews on his dad's company that he runs that's total bullshit like that man is uh he he's 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 staked uh whatever he has to put to get that business going and probably a bunch of money a bunch of time a bunch of effort and to go in and like put those negative reviews which it, you wouldn't think it has as big of effect as it does, but that that is not good on someone's company. I just I can't believe that our fan base is doing that. You're you're making yourself look really bad, and I know it's probably like 15 people out of the entire group, but it reflects horribly on our fan base. It's it's time to move on. Who cares? It's over. He's not the first player that we've lost that's really good and he won't be the last player that we lose that's really good. You just got to accept it and move on. Uh, the whole thing's been weird. It's been handled poorly from a bunch of different angles, but I like this. This needs to be the end of it and we get past it as a fan base. I don't think anything else needs to be said, man. That was uh, That was really well put. Let's move on to signing day. Uh, first and foremost, congratulations to all these young men. Uh, it is a it's a life changing day. It's an incredible accomplishment, and it starts a new chapter in your life. And, and I know that with NIL and the way that college football feels now, it it just feels different than it used to. But going to college for free is a big damn deal. And now that you can make money in college, it's it's even better. But it is a, it's a huge day. It's one of the most important days 
up to this point in these young men's lives. So it's, it, it's important to remember that we're going to go through the class w- with Josh McQuistion from Sooner Scoop, but Ted, we, we did the signing day show. Any big takeaways from what you heard from Joe John Finley, Seth Luttrell, Ted Roof, and, and of course, BV. Yeah, I, I thought Joe John Finley and Seth Luttrell were really good up there. Oh my uh, gosh. You talk about a likable duo now. Yeah. It's like peas in a pod, isn't it? I mean, that, that was, that was fun listening to those guys and, you know, Joe John did a really good job. And, you know, coach roof talking about the defense, you know, I, I would say like the biggest takeaway is, you know, and Venables, I, he's always going to be glowing about the uh, signing class that they put together, but he really likes a lot of these players. And what I think is, I th- what I, I really enjoy is you can tell that Coach Venables really loves the process with every single player, right? Like the whole process of finding them, recruiting them, talking to them, learning about them. Like he really enjoys that whole process, ultimately, where it ends with him signing. Uh, for a scholarship at Oklahoma, I think it's really cool, and I think it's why he does a su- such a good job recruiting. I'm with you. And it, what Venable says carries a lot of weight with me because we've known that man for a long time now. He doesn't just say stuff to say stuff. And when he said he believes it's his best class, I, that means something to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that tells you how excited he is about this group of young men. So I am – that that got me going a little bit. And, and then you look at the recruiting rankings. OU with the eighth-ranked class overall, another top-10 class. And you look at the on-three industry rankings. It's pretty funny because you got the eighth overall class, but it's the fifth-ranked class of the SEC. Right, This is the new reality. For Oklahoma football, you got Georgia at one, Bama at two, Texas at five, Auburn at seven. So it it got me to start thinking like, okay, how is OU going to get where they want to get when you're fifth in your conference in recruiting rankings? And it, it those rankings don't mean everything, but it it means something. They're bringing in the type of talent that they need to bring in. And just from some of the discussions I had, like they're doing what they need to do. They're very competitive when it comes to NIL and all that stuff. It's going to come down to development and retention. That's, that's what it's going to come down and culture. You are going to have to out develop some of these programs. It's unlikely that OU is going to out recruit Georgia. It just is with some of the natural advantages they have where that place is located and with what they've been doing the last couple of seasons. It's just, it's going to be really hard to out recruit Georgia. So you're going to have to out develop them. That's strength and conditioning. That's coaching. That's scheme. So the coaches are going to have to do a tremendous job. That's Schmitty. That's BV. That's everyone. Going to have to teach these guys. That's what's going to determine your success moving forward. And as far as the culture piece, that's going to be huge. Creating a program, an environment where guys want to stay, where it's really, really hard for them to either jump in the portal or leave for the NFL early. That's that's what it's going to take, man. I agree. And, you know, I know we were just talking about Caden Green, but they've done a really good job of that so far. Retention's been really good. Um, And, you know, I think it it is, you know, to be the number eight class and be the fifth in the SEC is, I mean, it's, it's almost, it's comical. Now, when you start to get into by five, six, seven, I, there can be, there can be a discussion as to who actually has the better class and, and where they're ranked, but not whenever you're comparing them to one and two, I, those, <laughs> you know, you look at there and 
it's like they they're clicking off five stars all the way down. So I do believe that the we've gotten an SEC bump for the fact that we're going to the conference. I think we will get an even bigger bump whenever we are in the conference. Uh, and especially if we go in, play well, hold our own, show that, you know, the program is on the rise. So, yeah, it the development, I, we are always going to have, um, uh, you know, I don't want to say that that other schools are going to have an edge against us because of geography. I mean, Georgia's right in the heart of it. You know, Texas, LSU, those places are right in the heart of it. It's not like we are West Virginia in the Big 12. We're regionally in the SEC. Um, we're different in a couple of ways, but I honestly, I think it, if you play well and develop well, I think it can be an advantage to say that like this is it, it's football factory is where you're going, right? You're leaving and you're going to a football factory to develop, to turn into a hell of a player and to go to the NFL. And like, that's gotta be our, our mission. It sounds like that's what they're doing. The new, the new world for Oklahoma football. You look at the top 25 classes. 13 of the top 25 are SEC schools. There's 16 SEC schools. 13 of the 16 top 25 class. Let's check in on the big 12. One. Now shout out to Joe McGuire in Texas tech checking in at 22. Good work, Joey juice. My guy. He's doing Good man. He's doing good. They're coming, but 13 of the top 25 in the SEC. That's just that's the new reality for Oklahoma football. Now, so what's get, that? 20 of 25 or SEC and Big 10? The power two. I I'm not sure if we're already there, but we're headed there. Cuz there are seven, uh, you know, seven of the top 25 were Big 10 teams. What the Big 10's got 18 teams now with the West Coast at, wing. At least at least. So, yes, you you talk about the two big-time players now in college football, the SEC and the Big Ten. They had 20 out of the top 25 recruiting classes. Mm. So, yeah, I think it, it's becoming clearer and clearer where this thing may be headed. But let's – that's a discussion for another day. Let, let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys your number one takeaway from National Signing Day. This first one comes from Sooner Virginia, who says, thrilled with this class, third straight top 10 class for BV, who is getting his guys and culture firmly established. I love the balance between offense and defense and how, his, how he is building the team from the line of scrimmage outward. It, it does seem like... And as I believe there always should be there, there was a big emphasis on the line of scrimmage in this class. I also factor the portal class into that as well, but yeah, this is as excited as I can remember OU fans being uh, as excited as they've been about a line of scrimmage group in quite some time, especially the defensive line group. Yeah. I think there's, what is there? 10 total offense or a, uh line of scrimmage guys between the offensive line and the defensive line. And frankly, I like all of them. I really do. I think there's, there's a ton of upside with all of the offensive linemen, Eddie Pierre, Louis, um, Akin Kumi, I Sosa, Eugene Brooks, uh, Isaiah Autry, who's gigantic. I, I and, think and Eugene the, Brooks this is my prediction. I think he's I think he's going to play some center. This is a guy that was, uh, you know, he was heavy. Has worked really hard, shed some weight. Just watching him, I, I, I think he's got some center capability. So I am, uh, you know, maybe he'll join the brotherhood. Let's go, Brooks. Come on, get it together. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the call your shot is correct. It's a line of scrimmage sport, and we continue to bolster. Um, there on the line of scrimmage and it's going to continue 
it's going to continue through the transfer portal. I imagine uh, there'll probably be another handful of guys, and I think O-line and D-line will, will be a big share of those. This other one comes from Silver Surfer, who says, enjoyed Venables in the press conference, and especially the SEC Now interview left them speechless. Do you see that? I didn't. They they basically said it was on SEC Network, and Roman Harper was on there, and they basically said, "Okay, give us, you know, give us the short version of like your recruiting pitch." And it was, it was exactly what you would think from Venables. You know, most coaches are thinking, "Oh, you know, he's going to talk about draft picks, going to talk about this, that, championships." He starts off with. You know what? I didn't have a great upbringing and it was rough. And the first time someone told me I loved you was a football coach and it became like football and being in a locker room is basically what shaped me and gave me purpose. And the, you know, kind of the short version is like, that's what I want for each and each and every one of these guys. Uh, and, And they were just sitting there going, and it's a, I mean, it's a two minute answer and it, it's fantastic. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out, but they cut back to the studio and they're all just like, wow, <laughs> I mean, it was, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I think that it's strange. He sounded like, he sounded like a coach that cares a hell of a lot about his players as human beings. That goes a long way. Sure does. All right, let's dive into this 2024 recruiting class with Josh McQuistion. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Love's Connect app unlocks exclusive deals can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, Be sure to download the Love's Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Love's Travel Stops. Love's also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamore. The land doctors have a 120 acre property for sale in East Norman, located just 10 minutes from campus. This completely wooded property sits at the intersection of East 120th Street and Tecumseh Road. If you're looking for a quiet place to go spend some time in the outdoors or a nice little hunting spot on the outskirts of town, this place is for you. There are also development and business opportunities with this property. Call Colton Cole to schedule a private showing at 405-615-7645 or shoot him an email at colton at landdoctors.com. And celebrate with a Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coupe Aleworks. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice cold beer from Coupe Aleworks. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie at OU Athletics events at the bar at the tailgate and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit SchoonerAle.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. All right, here is Josh McQuiston. It is our pleasure to be joined by undoubtedly the hardest working man at Soonerscoop.com. Josh <laughs> McQuiston is in the house. What's going on, big guy? Not a lot, guys. You know, uh, just this feels like the minute you get to breathe, but do, getting to do this with you guys, I mean, there is, it, it's it's Christmas is here now. Like, this is when I actually get to think about hanging out with my family at some point over the next week. It's hard to, I I always wonder, does it get harder every year? Does it get easier every year? Or is it just who even knows anymore? (laughs) I think I got to thank Brent a little bit because I mean, they were 27 for 27 yesterday and Taylor Tatum was the only moment that anybody was even sweating for a second. So like, that's, that's better. I mean, usually there's that one stray guy where you're like, I got to chase down his uncle or his grandfather and find out what's happening. But man, that was, that was easy yesterday. So that, that wasn't too bad. But as I say that next year will be a nightmare. I mean, that's just the way it always goes. (laughs) Yeah, that is, that's typically how it goes. Now, 
I think the best way to do this, as opposed to going through all 27 guys, is just kind of hit some broad questions and and see where it takes us. So let's start with a a simple yet complex question. Your favorite player in OU's 2024 recruiting class? You guys know me. I'm a recruiting guy by nature. I have to, I, I just, I look at measurables and things like that. Danny Okoye fascinates me. Like just the, the potential he has and to land him following PJ out of bar away. Like y- you, there's so much there. I mean, like there, there is so much there. And guys, the question that you had was, well, what's it going to look like when he faces real guys? And we saw him in the army bowl earlier this week. I think the consensus by everybody there, he was the best player on the field. And that's, that's not the Under Armour game. That's not the All-American Bowl in San Antonio. Like, the, it's a fall off in talent, but it's a big step up, and he didn't look bothered by it at all. So I, I think I'm pretty fascinated with what he could be. And uh, for people that would say, oh, he's a homeschool kid, stand next to Danny Okoye. Like, he is 240, and I can't think of a better way to say it than he looks carved out of wood. Like, this is a guy that lives in the weight room. And I just don't think he's going to have the the problem physically. Now, obviously, there's a lot to mentally learn, and there it's it is a big jump. I get it. it, it there's going to be growing pains, but I don't think it's as drastic as people think it's going to be. The homeschool thing is funny to me. I, you know, an athlete when you see it. Uh, why do I care if if he's ever even played football before? You know, high school football and college football aren't even really the same sport. But, you know, it's kind of interesting when since Coach Venables came, there's been a heavy effort to recruit in state. And it's crazy that the talent in state feels like it's getting better and better. I mean, Danny Okoye, and I know David Stone played in IMG, but he's an Oklahoma kid, and there's other great guys in this class, and it also feels like next year's class of Oklahoma players is going to be really strong too. It's kind of been wild the last couple of years. Yeah. I mean, and even as you go deeper, like you look at the sophomore class, there's already multiple guys with power five offers, including a couple of guys that have OU offers in that 26th class. So I, it is, it's a kind of an interesting chicken of the egg. Like, is there better talent these next few years or is Oklahoma giving these guys a little notoriety, a little shine, whatever you want to call it is that leading to more people kind of scouring the state and saying, Oh, there's guys here who can play. Um, but yeah, I, guys, I mean, we're all Oklahomans. We're counting David stone. He's, he's one of us. He, he, he's part of that, that deal. So we get to claim him and, you know, and David all along has been like, I'm coming home. Like, I mean, like he talks about it in that same terminology. So I, I do, I think this has been really good. I, I've said before, I think 2025, the, you know, for those, not familiar with these numbers and don't think about this garbage all day. Like I do uh, the, the upcoming junior class is probably as good as I've seen it in Oklahoma since that, um, that Oh six class. It was like Bradford McCoy, Gresham, all those guys. Now I'm not saying it's that good, but it's the best I've seen since that group. Uh, let's stick with the, the in-state recruiting stuff real quick. How different is it from what you're hearing from these prospects, I, I mean, how how different is it under Venables than it was under Riley and even under Bob late in his tenure? You know, part of it is the players, but their their perspective is is different because they only know this world, like they only know how it is to deal with these guys. When I talk to the coaches, that's the thing you notice, and it's something where it's very much a you know, guys didn't come by every year unless there was a guy. And I mean, I'm talking even major 6A Oklahoma City area programs that, that would have been an easy stop for a lot of schools. I thought largely, and I and I do want to say like a guy like Brian Odom previously, I thought Brian did a nice job in state and I want to give him his credit. But a lot of times previously in state, unless there was a guy there that was on OU's radar, Oklahoma wasn't making a real effort to get by. Now they might stop by for a quick pop in kind of a hi, how are you? That kind of thing. But they weren't sitting down and talking to these coaches and being, you know, what we all know Brent says relational all the time, like making sure those coaches are familiar because that's when you get into these scenarios where there's these guys that aren't that well-known. Cause I mean, people forget Danny Okoye 
you know, wasn't the guy that everybody knew as a sophomore. He was a homeschool kid that frankly had a teammate that was being more well recruited early on than Danny was. So um, I, I think that is what you see. And you get these coaches saying, Hey, you know, whoever his area guy is, whether, you know, it's, it's Brent that saw him most recently, or whether it's Ted roof or someone like that, they say, Hey coach, we saw this guy last Friday night. Maybe you should, you know, take a look at that huddle, look at his film and see what you think. And that's how you get those kind of heads up on guys, whether they're scholarship guys or preferred walk-on types. I mean, you, you're building that roster all the time. And we all know when it comes to those PWOs, the guys like Andy Bass from uh, Heritage Hall and Bergen Kaiser from Santa Fe, those guys get, you know, they help your roster be better and deeper. And for Oklahoma to land those guys has a lot to do with them putting a focus on those players early on. You know, one of the other things that w when Coach Venables made it here, got here and w was talking recruiting, it sent people into a tailspin was the, if if you're committed and you take a visit elsewhere, you're no longer committed. It It feels like, as you pointed out, 27 for 27 yesterday, not a lot of drama. And I don't know if that has anything to do it, but it feels like uh, most people thought that that was a disaster of a thing to say, but it feels like it's working out just fine. Teddy, I don't know if you looked at my timeline yesterday, but there are people <laughs> cheering you for bringing this up with me right now because I, I was on it yesterday. I said something unrelated, and somebody's like, well, what about the no-visit policy? You hated that. And I was like, that doesn't have anything to do with this. So we'll dive into this. But no, I am not a huge fan of it. I won't lie. But at the same time, you can't argue. I mean, like, I, I'm not denying at all that there are fewer decommitments. There just are. When you look at... 2019 and 2020, I, I did the numbers yesterday. I think there were 17 decommitments between those two classes. Now, a couple of the guys came back. A couple of them, I think, were just kind of processed. They just weren't guys that OU felt advanced as seniors like they hoped they would. So there's some mitigating circumstances, but there's no question. There are fewer guys decommitting, and I, I think that is that's definitely has to do with the system because you are – you have this idea of don't commit until you're ready. And that's, that's great. Like, I, I think that is, that's perfectly sensible. And it's going to add up to these numbers. My issue always was if you turn away a guy that's ready to pull that trigger, you can't sign before you commit. So I'm always a fan of just let them commit. And then you're going to have to recruit them really hard either way. So like, I, I just kind of felt like it's one of those things where it sounds good. Like I, I, I get the idea but it doesn't change anything for the coaches. So it just feels like one of those things where you get to say it's a victory, but I don't know. But there, but at the same time, there's no denying that it has slowed the decommitments in Oklahoma having to jumble their numbers, you know, into December. Looking at the O-line and D-line, we all know where this program is headed and what it's all about in the SEC. Who's your favorite O-lineman? in this class i i want to say i have listened to you guys last week and you are not wrong eddie pierre louise and i i said this on our pod yesterday i think brent really threaded that needle beautifully because we've all talked about louis or lewis which one it is and he kind of threw the louis and on the end of it and i was like well that just married all of it that's perfect <laughs> so we, we all can just kind of live with the the middle ground there but um guys uh, he's a guy i saw as a junior incredibly violent like just physical when he finishes I mean this is a guy that makes all the sense in the world for Bill Bedenboe like we know what he likes and he likes these kind of guys and then when you watch him run in space and you're like that's not normal like guys don't move like that and I can tell you as someone who has stood next to Eddie the 6'3 330 that's legit he's a big boy this isn't like a guy that oh he moves that well but you find out he's 290 like that that is a big big dude and for Oklahoma to have fought their way through to get him at the end, I, I think he's a really the only thing you could say is you wish he was coming in at semester. You wish that was that was possible and really add some depth and, you know, some talent to that interior of the offensive line. But to me, he's the guy you like. Uh, I love Daniel Ock and Kunmi. I think he may I could argue that he might have the most upside of any of them, but I think he's got the farthest to go. So there's, there's kind of that, you know, high ceiling, low floor kind of scenario. 
He does have, have an cool. awesome accent, which I don't know how much that means, but it means something, Josh. It, well, people I, are going to listen, right? Anything, anything better than getting pancaked and then a guy in a British accent uh, talking trash to you? It's just not going it, to – it's not normal, but it'll be great, especially in the South. That's going to be cool. <laughs> He's got to have something about like tea and crackers or something like something every time he body bags a, a, a little Southern American kid and just like destroys him. That that would be perfect just to only add shame to it. How about the the wide receivers? I think it's it's funny. Yesterday when we were doing the signing day show up at the Noun, I was looking at the the list of players and you had right next to each other you had a six six wide receiver. And you had like a five eight or five nine KJ Daniels, uh, smaller guy, but he's a burner. So I mean, there's like some different body types in there, makes it pretty cool. It, there really is, because you look at that receiver room, and I, you know, I, I I've said it before, maybe with you guys, uh, Bucky Brooks, guy that does a lot of the work for the NFL Network, like he talks about the receiver room kind of being like a basketball team, and and that's you know, you've got your point guards, you've got your power forwards, all that kind of stuff, and that's what Oklahoma did here. Uh, you know, you look at. Zion Raggins, who's probably five, seven and a half, five, eight little guy, but legitimately like 10, 300 speed. Like he can fly. He, he, he looks uh, when you watch him on tape. I, I mean, it, it's silly to compare people to Hollywood Brown with the production he had, but that's exactly what he looks like when you watch. Him. You're not wrong. Like 100% that, that is who he reminds you of from his size, from his frame uh, and, and talking to his coach last year, I think he twisted his ankle at some point, like a month out from state finals. So he won't get to be basically a four time, 100 meter state champion in Georgia. But I mean, he's almost a shoe in to be a three time. And, and I think last year with an ankle, he still ran like 10, five, five or something. Like, I mean, it still was, I mean, just insane. So, um, he, he's, uh, he's really exciting to watch. KJ Daniels has a lot of speed, but I think is a little bit more of, Almost your traditional slot guy going to, you know, be very good dragging across the middle, going to do stuff after the catch. Like you, you like a lot that he brings. Zion Kearney is kind of the jewel of the group and he is 6'2", 205. I mean, like uh, just a big, impressive looking guy and, you know, uh, comes from, you know, the same area of Houston as guys like Kenneth Murray, C.D. Lamb, like you name that kind of Southwest Houston area. And he brings a lot to the table. And again, it's another guy had an ankle injury this year, fought back, had a touchdown in the state quarterfinals, nearly pushed Hightower into uh, the state semis in Texas. So uh, he is, he's an outstanding talent. And Ivan Carrion is really interesting. Um, he's a guy that I saw on an off night. I mean, Ivan and I did an interview afterwards. It was kind of like, you know, what do we talk about here? Cause it just wasn't the night he would have wanted to have had a couple drops and just wasn't really on his game. Um, but at the same time, this is a guy that Emmett Jones had at Texas tech brought him to Oklahoma. This is a guy Emmett Jones believes in. I mean, I, and that that's what I kind of keep coming back to as well as I've seen Emmett Jones recruit both in the portal in recruiting, everything we could see him do. He has been outstanding at talent acquisition. So for him to say, I'm going to stand on this guy, I believe in Ivan carry on. It says a lot. Like it says that that guy, he really thinks there's something special there. No, Looking, uh, oh. no, you go ahead, Ted. No, sorry, I'm 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 out of order. <laughs> so no, get... you can you can ask your follow okay. up. I well, it, it's not really a follow up. It was, I whenever you look at the needs on the team, and and what they got in this kid, I think Devon Mitchell may be, I uh, that may be the gem of the entire class, offensive defense, just because like we got to have someone at that spot. Guys, it, you know, if you wanted to ask the question of who is the most likely guy of this class to start an opening day, it's Devon Mitchell. Like, th there's no question based on what's there. And that, guys, we're, we we all forget he should just be going, he be, should be in the middle of his junior year of high school. Like, this is a kid that's going to be a year early anyway. And he is so big and so physical. Now, He's going to have to put in a lot of work in the weight room. You know, you go to a place like Allen and there is a lot of development. He spent the last year at Los Al uh, due to Malachi Nelson and Makai Lemon and all the guys. I've spent a lot of time around Los Al over the last four or five years. It's different in Southern California. The, the, unless you're modern day or Bosco, the, 
attention to the weight room and those sort of things. It's just not the same. It's not pushed all the time. And that's not a fault of the guys at Low Sal. It's just a different mindset. It is. And that was something Devon and I talked about when I went out and saw him this season was just kind of like, I have to make sure I stay locked in because it's easy to get distracted and do other things, which is a little different from a Texas powerhouse like Allen and some of those schools that just football all the time. So I, I think that's going to be really interesting how he immediately gets into the weight room with Jerry Schmidt, how he does that work. But the physical talent, I, I've said it before, and this is no offense to a tight end from Bishop McGinnis, but the three best tight ends I've covered doing this were Jermaine Gresham, Mark Andrews, and Devon Mitchell, as far as guys that ended up in Oklahoma. So you're talking about pretty rare air there. And he, he has a chance to be a, you know, a, a future, uh, I guess, a lofty NFL draft pick someday. Josh, you do, you do a really good job of, you know, breaking down what happens on the field on Saturdays for OU. And I think we can all agree the running back position needs to be more dynamic. Is is Tatum the type of guy you could see being a factor the second he steps on campus? I think when he walks on campus, he is the most talented running back Oklahoma has. Now, does that mean he's ready to go? I don't know. What I can say is a program like Longview, they don't mess around. They know what they're doing. That's a tough program. It's not going to shock him, the work he has to put in. Like John King, uh, you know, uh, for those that remember Haynes King at Texas A&M, John King is his father, has been the coach at Longview forever. That dude does not run a loose ship. Like that, they they do things the right way, and there's a reason Longview is always very very good. Um, so I, I think to me, it's just a matter of what kind of shape does he arrive in? Since he, we know he won't be enrolling at semester, he's going to have to stay on it because he's be do he'll be doing baseball all spring, and you know, for those that don't recognize that this isn't a token thing. Oklahoma baseball is very excited about Taylor Tatum. They think he is a special, special guy. Um, so I, if he can come in and he can pick up the things, and we and guys, we all saw it last year. We know DeMarco's not going to put him out there. If he's not ready, can't do all the little things that you have to do to be a quality player at Oklahoma or to be at OU's level, I – he won't he won't be out there but from a physical just he has the instincts and knows how to run and does the little things Taylor Tatum's the most talented back I think they've signed in a while like he he is truly a special guy and they can throw the ball to him he's big enough to handle the stuff between the tackles he's um he's just very very gifted yeah um this D-line group I know we talked about Okoye a little bit but uh, just overall, what do you think? Um, it's got to be one of the better halls that they've signed in a while on the defensive line as a group. And I mean, you got some different body types in there. It looks pretty solid. Yeah, I, I, I was taught guys. I, I think what's amazing when you look at this D line group is I don't know that Todd Bates and Miguel Chavis even realize how drastically they've changed the narrative and what a short amount of time. They they were both down there at Nigel Smith when he announced uh, prior to the first ho uh, high school home game at Melissa. And, you know, of course, I'm down there covering his announcement and that sort of stuff. And I, I just kind of threw out, hey, guys, the previous 10 years before they got there, if I remember the numbers right, Oklahoma had signed one or two top 100 defensive linemen. In the last two classes, they've signed four. And that just, you're like, the, the numbers there and what you're doing to – not only change what Oklahoma is going to be going forward, but to do it without any real backing guys. I mean, the last time Oklahoma had a first round draft pick, which is what a lot of these kids look at. I know people want to say, well, how great are they going to be at OU? These kids want to know if they've got a chance to go to the NFL and for for these guys, there's no track record since Gerald McCoy in, in 2010. So I think it's amazing what they've been able to say of, Look what we did at Clemson. We're going to do it here at Oklahoma and make that pitch to these guys. So I, I think that's just incredible. And yeah, I mean, Danny Okoye, David Stone, Nigel Smith, those are, uh, those are huge wins. I mean, they beat Ohio State for Nigel Smith. Danny Okoye was Texas, Tennessee, LSU. I mean, he could have gone a lot of places. David Stone could have went anywhere he wanted to go. So these aren't just guys where, you know, kind of, you kind of say, oh, yeah, they, they kind of fell into a good spot there and there wasn't a lot of competition. These are guys that everybody wanted. So I think that's huge. And 
the two guys that get overlooked, Wyatt Gilmore is going to be a good football player. He is physical. He's tough. Um, really sets the edge well. I, I, I like him as a kind of strong side defensive end. You see him playing at like 265, 270, being a big, powerful guy. Got a, He's huge shoulders, just a big, broad guy. Um, and then Jaden Jackson. Guys, there are a lot of years where Jaden Jackson would be the best defensive lineman OU signed, and they'd be pretty happy to have done it. So for him to come in and just be a future bowling ball of a nose tackle, it's just a huge win for OU. Seven defensive backs in the class, Powers, Hardy, Newcomb, Boganowski, Jordan Bowen, and Patterson McDonald. W which guys really stood out to you uh, as you were evaluating him? For me, it's Reggie Powers. I, I watch him, and I see a very complete safety. I see a guy that can drop off, play man. He can play in zone. But then when you watch him come up and play downhill, he is violent. I mean, th there's a lot you like about his game. Uh, you know, I, I had someone kind of say, well, you know, compare him to like Billy out of high school. Billy was more of a natural playmaker, which we've all seen. I mean, Billy is just around the ball. He's constant. Um, I don't know that Reggie has quite that level, but he's more physically gifted. I mean, he is six foot 185, uh, runs very well. I mean, th th there's, there's not really a hole in his game. I, I would kind of say he's almost a safety version of Taylor Tatum where maybe there's not that one thing that screams at me, but he's really good at all of it. So I, I just like his game a lot. Uh, and, and a fun note, distantly related to John Legend. So that that's kind of a, a fun little Reggie Powers note there. But, um, you know, just a really interesting guy. Boganowski, that's one of those guys that, uh, you know, and I think I talked about this last year with some of the guys they had brought in. He is as good as Brent is creative, and we know that's not a problem. So... I just, there's a lot of ways you could use him. He could grow into a linebacker. He could play a pure cheetah. I think they're going to start him as a true safety and just kind of see where that takes him. But I mean, this is a 6'2", 205 pound kid that will light you up across the middle. Uh, Eddie and George, our guys went and saw him in a playoff game right before the um, before the Kansas game that we don't want to talk about. But, you know, he he played really well that night and we had just just him knocking poor Kansas kids head off. I mean, it was just violent all the time. And so I, those two really stick out to me. Um, but it's hard to listen to BB talk about Eli Bowen and not be like, okay, Oklahoma's really got something here. They, that was something I heard all throughout Peyton Bowen's recruitment was Eli has nothing to do with Peyton. They wanted Eli Bowen. If Peyton would have gone to Oregon or Notre Dame or wherever it was, they still would have hoped to sign Eli in this class because He's kind of like I talked about with Billy. He's just constantly around the ball, breaking up passes, getting into running lanes. And when he catches the ball, he's picked off a couple. I think he had two two or three pick sixes this year. So, I mean, just a, just a dominant player with the ball in his hands. Now, we heard, I think Coach Venable said, uh, maybe, I don't know if it was yesterday or or leading into it, that they hope to sign 27 or 28 guys is this class done i know signing day was yesterday but you know you could still sign guys for what another couple of months are we done with this thing they have got two at this point now you never know sometimes there's a there's a guy that oh you thought okay he's gonna sign with alabama or he's gonna sign with whoever it may be whoever they kind of had an eye on and then maybe somebody leaves in the portal and they kind of say, okay, we've got a spot, you know, we've got an open roster spot at that kid's position. There, so there are variables that could happen, but I really think there are two guys they're still seriously involved with. And that's Dominic McKinley, the big five-star defensive lineman from Louisiana. We all remember, really think, oh, you came in second with him to Texas A&M the first time around. And uh, with all the change at A&M, he kind of has reopened it, but has really stayed committed and kind of says he's going to stick with A&M. Um, we'll see. He's not signing in this early period from everything we've gathered. That's what his mother has told some people at, at on three, the network I work for. And so I we'll see, I, I think it's possible, but the problem for OU there is they've already used their official visit and Brent Venables has already done his in home. That's kind of your, your big punch in December or January, whatever it is, is to have that in home visit with the head coach and Oklahoma's already done that, so I don't know what moves they still have to make unless they can get him back up to campus. The other one that's interesting is D'Alen Evans, a uh, uh, kid from Texas, Longview Pine Tree. 
Uh, in spite of being from Longview, the guy that he's connected to in the class is not Taylor Tatum, but instead uh, Nigel Smith, the big defensive lineman from Melissa. They are good friends. Nigel's talking to him. Uh, I think a, an official visit in January is very possible. Uh, and from there, anything could happen. This is another guy, longtime A&M commitment, just kind of decided not to sign. He's going to look around. Um, you hear some Texas buzz right now, but I don't think anything is set with him. And if there was one of the two I thought, oh, you could maybe really shock some people with, I would probably say it's Evans. Is is the biggest compliment we can give Jackson Arnold the fact that we haven't talked about the two quarterbacks coming in? <laughs> that That's, that's usually not how it goes, Josh. Yeah, usually that's all we want to talk about. I mean, even Jackson last year, we we knew – we knew Dylan was coming back. We knew Jackson had been committed for months and still everybody wanted to talk about the five-star quarterback. So you, you're right. But you look at these two guys, I mean, from a production standpoint, it's hard to find much issue between the two of them. They basically averaged a thousand yards rushing. So these guys are very good athletes. Uh, Brendan Zerberg. I know a lot of people kind of think, Oh, he's an Ohio kid. He's, you know, it's Kirk Herb Street out there. No, that's not what it is. I mean, th this guy ran for, ran for over a thousand yards in eleven games this year, and you know, I think it was like twenty seven to four with its touchdown to interception ratio. Uh, just a very solid player. I really liked that evaluation from Jeff Levy. You know, want to give him his credit for really chasing that guy down when not a lot of people were talking about the kid. But I, I thought that was a really good find. Really gives Oklahoma some nice nice depth at quarterback. And then you get to Michael Hawkins, who had 52 touchdowns this year, took his team to the state semifinals, and really gave South Oak Cliff a lot. Like, th there was a lot of thought, and I, I certainly was one of them, that that was going to be a real problem. And, you know, who who had Emerson played to that point? But they played South Oak Cliff tough. And South Oak Cliff was two-time defending state champion, is full of Division One athletes. So I, I really was impressed with that. And I, the biggest thing I noticed, guys – his junior year, his completion percentage was around 56%. It jumped to 69% his senior year. And I thought that was a real telling indication of him still growing as a passer. Because if there's anything I would question about Mike, it's just that accuracy. How consistent can he be? Because sometimes his mechanics are not always repeated. He can get a little off. And I think that can hurt him at times. And I thought this year he looked much cleaner. So, I again, I, I think Oklahoma – did a nice job holding off some schools. I had heard Arkansas tried to make a late run. Um, you know, so I, I, again, I think that's a, it's, it's telling for Jackson Arnold, but at the same time, I don't want those guys to be seen as, you know, they can't be quality players. Cause if either one of them became a starter someday, I don't think anyone should be shocked. Impossible to do, but whenever you, you know, take the class as a whole, how do you compare it to, you know, some of the recent, highly ranked classes that we've had I think it stands up right there next to last year it's a little different because there's not as much star power there's not the Peyton Bowen there's not the Jackson Arnold the the PJ you really have David and I, I put Danny in that caliber I, I think Danny's a top 50 guy in the country regardless of how our side or any other network ranks him like I, I think he is a truly special talent the declassification for uh Devon Mitchell like that yeah I mean it took him from being like wow five star amazing and then all of a sudden it's like no one talks about him absolutely and and, and I agree and I think I, the question for me is the depth of the two is which one I like better to me I probably lean just a little bit to 2024 because of the defensive line and I know how rare that is and I know how hard it is to get those guys um Oklahoma's never had a problem landing elite quarterbacks. They've landed elite safeties in the recent, you know, in, in years past. Um, so to me, just having those bodies up front. Now, if Oklahoma could have landed like a Grant Bricks, like just one more offensive lineman that really has some really high end potential, I think I'd be all in on 24, but it's really close. Like, and I, I heard Brent's comment, like, you know, kind of considering this one is best one yet. And, you know, who knows how much he's really considered that, you know, I, I don't think coaches spend a lot of time thinking about it in those terms. Um, but it, it's a close argument and there's no question. It's one of the better classes I've seen OU sign in the last decade. So all I know is the last three years and really primarily the last two, you've seen the talent get much better in North. All right. Last question. 
and it's prediction time, Josh. <laughs> highly two two parter for you. Number one, right. really highly ranked guy that you think is a sure thing. Number two, lower ranked guy that you think could be end up being an all conference, all American, like really, really successful player. I would say, and it depends on how far you want to go down the list on, you know, highly ranked player. But as far as like four star above that kind of thing, I would say Reggie Powers. If there was a guy I was going to say, I'm going to bet my bottom dollar, this guy is going to be a really good football player. I have very few questions. It's Reggie Powers because he gets it from a mental standpoint. He's physically gifted and he comes from a good program. There's just not a lot of variables with him. Now, how good he's going to be, we, we can have that conversation. But I just think he is one of those guys that has a very high floor. I don't expect him to have a lot of problems. And I wouldn't be shocked at all if he has a considerable role this year, whether it's as a, a cheetah, as a backup, or you know, just finding ways to get him on the field when they can. Um, as far as a lower-ranked guy that I think could go on and be a really good player, I would probably say, and I'm kind of torn between an offensive lineman and a de defensive lineman, but since I've been tough on the offensive line, I'll say Daniel Akinkumi. I, I just think there's a lot there. He's going to need time. People are going to have to be patient with him. But you watch this kid at some of the camps where he's faced some elite guys. And I know camps are camps. I understand. But he's physically overwhelmed some people. And you're just like, he doesn't know what he's doing yet. And there's so much still to learn. And Daniel... I, Daniel may see this and he will bristle because he's like, I've been coached, you know, like he, he takes it very seriously. And I think that's part of why I buy into him because he's very intentional about his work, what he thinks he wants to be like, you know, after the whole Caden green thing, he tweeted out, like, I'm, I'm just trying to go to the NFL. I don't care about all that stuff. You know, it's some of the things that we know have been rumored. So he is, he's a guy that's about the work and that's the kind of guy that bill tends to have a lot of success with. And I look at his raw tools, his size, and I, I just think he's incredibly interesting to see what he could become. Nice. I like it. Well, we'll have to have you on again soon to talk some OU basketball. We ran out of time, unfortunately, <laughs> in, in this one. But you, you're what makes Sooner Scoop go, man. Keep doing your thing. We appreciate you. Hey, guys, anytime. Enjoy it. Josh does a tremendous job. Uh, I got a lot of respect for him. He goes and sees a bunch of these guys that commit to Oklahoma in person, talks to them, interviews them, uh, just does a really nice job, watches a ton of tape, everything he can get his hands on. So I, I appreciate all the work he puts in to to evaluating these guys and, and you know, establishing relationships, getting to know them. Yeah, fantastic. He does a really good job. Um not just winging it, knows about these guys, follows them, follows them for a long time. Awesome. Love having him on. Yeah. Let's finish up with our winners and losers of the week. But first, John Vance Auto Group has a deal for Oklahoma Breakdown listeners. Go to any of their nine full-service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, and Guthrie. Tell them we sent you, and they'll give you $500 off. That's $500 off just because you listen to this podcast. They've been serving Oklahomans for 40 years, family owned and operated no matter what your vehicle needs are. John Vance Auto Group has you covered. They carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way. You can find all their information about their lifetime loyalty program, browse their entire inventory, and find the John Vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com. And attention, business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing and will design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, You'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to the garage. Oh, gosh, dang it. Head <laughs> to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. And with all the garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com. 
to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. Nice. Nice recovery. Sorry, Lyman, but- well done. <laughs> as always, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? I guess I, for a winner, I've got to go with uh, air quote neutral site college basketball games, you know, uh, going to a neutral site in North Carolina to play North Carolina isn't exactly neutral, but congratulations to them, both Duke and North Carolina handing it to the big 12 last night. That was tough to watch. That was, that was unfortunate. Uh, clearly we were locked in to OU's battle with North Carolina. I don't know how much the neutral court had to do with them turning the ball over that much. I know. That was Turnovers. disappointing. And like it was they were they were late in the game and I think they were down oh I don't know was it I think it was like 13 14 points and like they flashed up exactly what you're talking about the turnovers and points off turnovers and wouldn't you know the difference in the points off turnovers was the exact difference in the score of the the basketball game um it was tough but hey, you know you're gonna you're gonna take some of those as as they come together as a team and, and play in some tougher games. It's good to go in there in a challenging environment, play a good team, and uh, see the things they need to do better. One of them, and they've been great, but they gotta hit free throws. No kidding. Turnovers, missed free throws, and a lot of missed open shots. Yeah, it was. You know, best way to put it, they picked a bad night to have a bad night. Now, credit to Otega Owe. He was awesome. Yeah. Talk about the bright spot for the team in that one. I thought that he he rose to the level of competition. He embraced everything that went into that game. Right? You're on ESPN, you're playing North Carolina, you got you're playing on this cool Jordan court in in Charlotte. I, I was really impressed with how he he represented himself in that game. Like he's, I, I honestly, I think differently of him because of how he performed on that stage. Also thought Jalen Moore played a really solid game for him. And, and maybe that has something to do with that athleticism that he had. Like he didn't feel overwhelmed by the athleticism and link that North Carolina had. But got to get more from the bench, man. Just got to. Yeah. And. OU is going to lose some games when McCollum has off nights. I, I think that's just the reality of where this team is at. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. I thought, and I don't know, maybe you saw it differently, but I thought they made it tough on North Carolina defensively. You know, they were, they would stack several stops together, but just couldn't get anything going on the offensive side. You know, I, I thought, I actually thought that they were getting the benefit of the doubt on a lot of those calls in the second half. It almost felt like the refs were saying, let's try to get this game a little tighter. And we just couldn't make any of the free throws. You know, so I, I don't know. I'm, it does feel like maybe, and even though you weren't in North Carolina's home arena, it did kind of feel like maybe the, just like, how big the game was, you know, two, two teams in the top 10, you're playing on the Jordan court, you know, it's a prime time game that everyone's going to be watching. It felt like that was kind of hanging over the team and just couldn't get it going. Yeah. They, especially early, it, it looked like they were tight, Yep, which is understandable, but you look at where this team is at 10 and one. I think that, the way that that game unfolded, I think it'll be a good learning experience for all those guys. It is, it's still the most excited I've been for OU basketball in years. Yeah, same. So, yeah, not did they play the way you the way you wanted them to play on that stage? No, but am I hopeful that you know they'll learn a lot from it, be able to correct some of those things, and, and be able to use what they learned and kind of the pressure that they felt in that game. Will they be able to, you know, kind of grow from that? Yeah. I think, I think that's the case, but 
I wanted them to win that game real bad, and they didn't. I know it. I know it. It's fun though. I, I'm I'm with you. It's it's early. You got to remember, and I don't know what North Carolina. I, I know they've got several guys that have played there a while, but this team is like they're still getting to know one another to a certain degree, right? And they're going right. to have some ups and downs as they as they get closer as a team and you know build off of each other's strengths and weaknesses and in some of the like you got to go into an environment and and maybe get exposed a little bit to figure out more about yourself and where you need to to focus some energy so still really excited about it no doubt all right who do you have as your loser of the week i guess michigan ncaa notice of allegations um I, it's like the same it's like it keeps repeating itself over and over with Michigan, doesn't it? It's like, it's the same stuff. And really all we found out is, well, that some off field coaches did some on field stuff. And, you know, there was some recruiting during COVID that was wrong. It wasn't a cheeseburger, but they still don't really tell us what it is. I feel like it's, um, I'm probably the only person that watches this crap, but it, do you ever watch like a uh, congressional hearings whenever they're talking to the FBI, which I only watch those things. I like hate watch them just to see how big of crooks our entire government is all every single person in it. Um, but it's like, Oh, that's an ongoing investigation. We can't talk about that. It's like, that's what the NCAA is doing. Just tell us what it is. Just to, like this isn't a national security issue. Just tell us what's going on. I don't know. It's it's weird. And at some point, like Michigan has to be hit for this stuff, right? Or is this like a Kansas situation? I, I think right so. I, I it it's pretty clear the NCAA does not like Jim Harbaugh. Right now, if he you know, you violate the rules, you violate, okay? In hindsight, the cheeseburger thing feels very silly. I think we saw a, it was Ole Miss, I believe, had a Juco wide receiver roll up to his signing day in a Lamborghini. <laughs> and we are, and we're over here worried about Jim Harbaugh buy to recruit a cheeseburger. Seriously? I mean, that's what we're worried about, but. Do you think Harbaugh's there next year? I uh, yeah, I do, but I, I I guess I don't know. I I don't know. It's hard. It's hard for me to gauge. I he's like he's the weirdest person in football. It's he hard recruited to get... me. Can confirm. Weird guy. He's weird. So I don't, I don't know. Sometimes it looks like he's happy to be there and having fun and, you know, on he goes and other times he, it feels like he could leave at any moment. I have no idea. I don't even know if he knows. It's pretty nice though, to sit back and let someone else coach your team and make like $10 million a year. <laughs> or I guess w make whatever does it go away from your suspension? Yeah, whatever's left over. Yeah. I, they ended up, I'm looking at it right now, 24-7 uh, Sports Composite has them with the 15th ranked recruiting class. They've been awesome at developing players, though. That is, that, I think that's something that has really separated them uh, from a lot of people. But it's so strange. They got a chance to win the national title this year. They've absolutely had it rolling for the last three seasons. And I'm sitting here going, are they going to have the same head coach next year over the cheeseburger? <laughs> it's just, it's such a weird situation that doesn't even factor in the Cotter Stallions uh, arm of this, of this uh, story. So I well, just a like, really weird situation at Michigan. It's like, it, I feel like it's going to be one of those things where the day after their season is done, it's going to be, Oh, um, Michigan gets, gets a postseason ban or something, right? Like as soon as their season is done and this year is over with, 
that's whenever we're going to find out whatever punishment the NCAA is is going to um, cook up. I mean, you never know with the NCAA. There's no consistency. It's just a total one-off. So we'll see what it is. Maybe a slap on the wrist. Maybe it's more than they deserve. Who knows? I can't wait to find out. All right, let's get to my winner and loser. But first. Elevate your tailgate with Chapel Supply and Equipment, Oklahoma City. Chapel Supply and Equipment has generators and inverters on hand that will give you all the power you need so you can take your tailgate to the next level. They've also got top-of-the-line heaters to keep you warm during those cold tailgates later in the season. Oklahoma owned and operate. O- Oklahoma owned and operated. Elevate your tailgate by calling 405-495-1722 or visit chapelsupply.com. That's C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L supply.com. And First Fidelity Bank knows how to keep fans like you happy with more than 50 awards in the last five years, including Forbes Best in State Bank, the Oklahoma's Community Choice Awards, and the Journal Records Reader Rankings. It is clear that they are Oklahoma's number one pick for quality banking. And you find that level of outstanding service in everything FFB offers. Open an account at an award-winning bank today at ffb.com. First Fidelity Bank, we go where you go. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma City. Grounded in a faith-based education, Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSSAA athletics, and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org financial aid is available and head to opolisclothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there that's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com and use promo code TED T-E-D for 10% off that's opolisclothing.com and use promo code TED for 10% off buttery soft and 10% off All right, for my winner of the week thought about going with John Morant Back from the 25 game suspension and still well, turns out very good at basketball. Had 34, eight and six in his first game back for the Grizzlies, including the game winner to complete a big comeback to beat the Pelicans. Please just stay off Instagram live, man. It's so fun to watch you play basketball. It was great to have him back. They're in action tonight against the Pacers. It's going to be really interesting. They were 6-19 and 19 in those 25 games without him. I j- just, just don't do anything dumb, Job. We want to watch you play basketball, and I want to see where they end up because yeah. he's just – he's electric to watch, man. He is. The, the athleticism he brings is just incredible. Yeah, that's – I mean, I don't know what else their other issues are um, on their roster, but – that's that's a pretty telling record without him, right? Yes. Did not the they did not have a good start. Maybe they maybe they dug too much of a hole. We'll see. But yeah, it was pretty obvious that he makes a big difference for that basketball team in his first game <laughs> yeah, back. I'd say so. I'd yeah. say it, so. He's like running through the tunnel going, I kept receipts. Receipts. You're the one that put it on Instagram Live. What do you mean receipts? Just, I just want, don't do any Instagram live, John Morant. Just do do your thing. Just don't, don't do anything live on the internet. And you should be good, man. It'll be all good. You should be good. But my winner of the week, and it, it's story time here. Uh, I like to keep it sports related as possible, but this story is too good not to share. My winner of the week, social media and the good it can do. So, I've been trying to watch Christmas movies with my son. Asked for some recommendations, uh, you know, a week or so ago uh, on X. And one of the main ones was the new animated Grinch, right? They call it like the Illumination version. I hadn't seen it, but we watched it. And my son was very scared of the Grinch at the start of the movie. But... Made him battle through it. It was not going well, but made him battle through it. And he really ended up liking the movie. Uh, And he's watched it a couple of times now. 
and asked to watch it, and we've watched it a couple more times. Tuesday morning, he started telling us with complete confidence that the Grinch was coming to see him on Tuesday night. I asked him why he thought that, where it was coming from, convinced. Grinch is coming to see me tonight. We're going to shoot baskets. He's going to play with my cars with me. Unwavering confidence that the Grinch was coming to hang out, Ted. My wife and I were looking at each other like, oh, no. What, like, what the hell did we do? <laughs> He's convinced. So. I, were you like, well, he's busy this time. Of that's exactly. It was. He lives really far away. He's busy. <laughs> like it, it'll take him a long time to get here. So I, I don't know, buddy. He's coming back from Achilles. Not probably <laughs> going to play much hoops right now. Yeah, it, but it was, it was one of those moments where, before you have kids, you hear parents say, "Hey, you'll do anything for your kids," right? You're like, okay, I mean, you know, right. And then you have kids and you're like, yeah. So it's absolutely true. I started searching Oklahoma City for a Grinch costume called Costume Shops, uh, called Party City. And then I remembered that tweet I had about the movies. There was a guy that responded to it because like, my son is scared of the Grinch, not off to a good start. And there was a guy that responded to it with a picture of him in a Grinch costume that said, like, well, he wouldn't like me then. So what do I do? I slid into that guy's DMs. I said, hey, man, let me, uh, can, can I borrow your Grinch outfit? <laughs> Is an OU fan named Jeremy Clark. And... Without hesitation, immediately DMs me back. It's like, absolutely, where do you want to meet? We met at a Starbucks in Oklahoma City. He gave me the costume. Did he show up in costume? No, no but he did oh. show up in a lime green big truck. And I was like, this guy, <laughs> this guy does not mess around. <laughs> Incredibly nice guy. I got to chat with his wife as well. Uh, we got to take a picture with him, but he didn't have to do that. And I, so I didn't pay one of my buddies to wear the costume and come over. I called him. I said, Hey man, I got a weird one for you. My buddy Kurt. <laughs> and he, he does, he, he does a lot of stuff for me, uh, especially when we're out of town. Uh, hey man, I got a weird one for you. And he goes, what time do you want me to be there? <laughs> so he gets there he's in the full costume rings the doorbell standing at the door my son goes sprinting around the corner and sees him and then real life set in he's he was a little unsure at the start right naturally completely understandable took a little bit to uh to warm up to it but eventually they're shooting baskets together the Grinch is rolling his little toy cars back and forth with them. For some reason, high fives were off limits. That was the only thing. It was like, no, 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 no high fives. No. Okay. But, and it was pretty impressive because I, I, I put the mask on when I got the costume from Jeremy Clark and not easy to see out of. So the Grinch's shooting percentage was wildly impressive on the goal inside our house because I know it was not easy to see in that thing. So that that's just a an unnecessary Not detail. See, hot, uh, oh. but but after cool. the fact, the Grinch is there for I don't know twenty five minutes or so, just playing with them. And after the Grinch leaves, of course, it, it's the coolest thing that has ever happened for my son. And it, it was just a reminder, dude, that like social media. I know that a lot of bad comes from it. But it can also connect you to some really great people. Jeremy Clark didn't have to do that. He didn't have to say, yeah, man, where where do I need to meet you? And I tried to pay him. I tried to buy him and his wife dinner. And he just said, no, man, hey, you're doing you're trying to do something great for your kid. Yeah, your money's no good here, basically. Yeah. There's not mo 
not really any other way to to crowdsource a Grinch costume on the fly and be able to pull it off that quickly. So that that's pretty cool. Job well done by everyone. And shout out to Kurt for getting it done. Uh, it was a tremendous performance. And like it was... Yeah, it went as well as I could possibly have imagined, but it was just a great reminder. There's some awesome people out there and that social media can connect us to a lot of great people. So I, I would like to encourage everyone that listens to this to please tweet Jeremy Clark. His handle on Twitter is at OU football fan. So I knew I had a good chance when I reached out. Okay. <laughs> I knew I had a good chance. I knew it. I liked my odds, but at OU football fan, please let him know how awesome he is. Please thank him. And also please thank him for his service. Served in the military for over 25 years, just oh, retired. Wow. So he is the reason that, and we, my wife took lots of pictures, lots of videos. It, he is the reason that my family and I, we have this, this awesome memory that I, that we're going to be able to look back on for a long time. So tweet that man and tell him how great he is at OU football fan on X Twitter, whatever people call it. But yeah, man, I very cool. I know that that's a long story, but it was, it was one of those where you're trying to be a good parent. You need help. And some stranger helps you out for no reason. And it ends up working out perfectly. It was, uh, it, it was awesome, man. That's cool. Very well done by all parties and uh, even by parents pulling it off. How about that, man? Proactive parenting. Trying our best over here. Trying our best. All right. For my loser of the week. Thought about going with the James Harden haters. <laughs> People were dunking on Harden when they're on that losing streak when he got to the Clippers. Now, it's not like he's an elite defender or anything like that, but after that shaky start after the trade, the Clippers are rolling, dude. I got some star power now. Nine straight after a win in Dallas on Wednesday night. Kawhi dropped a 30-piece in that one. Maybe the hottest team in the league. And guess who they have Thursday night? Ooh, in the Oklahoma one. City. We'll be in the house for that one. So I am... Very excited to watch the Clippers and the Thunder go at it tonight. Cannot wait. Yeah. Hey, James Harden, it takes him a while to get going. He shows up for, like, not for training camp, for the beginning of the season, out of shape. Takes him about 20, 25 games to hit that stride, baby. Then he gets rolling. I like it. But my loser of the week, Colorado. Mm. What is Coach Prime doing? Everyone says the same thing about recruiting. You have to build your foundation with high school players, and then you address your glaring needs with the portal. I understand the way you went about it last year because of just how bad that roster was. Colorado signed five. Five high school players on National Signing Day. It was supposed to be six, but apparently... The gym of their class, the five-star offensive tackle, Jordan Seaton, who went on Skip Bayless's show and talked about his commitment to Colorado like two weeks ago, is apparently going to end up at Maryland, or I guess Dylan Riola is trying to get him to Nebraska, but I know this, he didn't sign with Colorado. I, Pretty wild, right? Now, they've got 16 portal guys, Ted, but... If I was a Colorado fan, this has to be alarming, right? This is not how you, this is not how you build a roster and develop a program. And it makes you wonder, like, how long is Dion going to be there? Yeah. When Shadur goes to the NFL next season, is Dion going to say, all right, guys, see ya. That, that, I mean, help me make sense of this five High school recruits, dude. Well, it's it's not nearly enough. I I 
to a certain degree, I understand the thinking. The thinking is we will spend our time and resources scouting the transfer portal and college football, and we'll let everyone else spend their time recruiting high school kids, bringing them into their program, spend a ton of money and resources getting them up to speed. And once they do that, we'll start plucking guys. I mean, the reasoning is sound if it w could only go that way. And I don't think it can go that way. I don't think it can be, be done that efficiently. Um, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. If you had a ton of money, like a ton, then perhaps, but the, the main thing, like you've got to have bodies. You got to have a lot of bodies. You got to have scout team guys. I mean, you need a lot of people there to, to run a great program. And I I'm kind of with you. It feels like this is just a short term stop. And this is the easiest way to spend our, our time and, and energy is transfer portal. And cause recruiting high school, it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time, effort, like behind the scenes trap. Like it's a, it's a huge undertaking. And if, if it were possible to just skip over all of that and just go with transfer portal, I think a lot of people would be like, yeah, let's just do that. That makes a lot of sense. But there's a reason people aren't doing it is because you, I just don't think you can do the numbers that you need. I, I think Colorado, I, I think the exposure that Deion Sanders brought to college football this year was a great thing. I really do. I think he got more people interested in college football, which is a really good thing. But Colorado has had as much coverage as any program in the country this season. And that includes the stuff that they have. They put out their own YouTube stuff. Right? Deion Sanders Jr. puts out all of that stuff inside. Look at the program, like all these different things. I don't think I've seen one thing of Coach Prime recruiting. In-home visit, talking to a high school coach. Maybe I've just missed it. But... That would be his real strength if he would right. it, spend some time doing it. If he if he put the time, if Deion Sanders is walking into the building, it's a big deal. And maybe it's happening and they're just not putting it out there. They put everything else out there. So I, I don't know. It's strange. It, it, it's really strange to me. But, you know, you look at the rankings and, you know, they're, they're not everything, but they're something. 24-7 Sports does this overall ranking where it includes transfers and your high school class. Like, it kind of blends it. And they're number 21 in that. Like they're, they're bringing some really solid players in the portal. But their composite ranking, where it's just high school recruits, 99th. I'm shocked that there's... <laughs> They brought in five guys, and there's... Well, I think the five-star tackle is still considered a commit and hasn't been removed from the ranking yet. I think. I don't know that for sure. But they're dead last. In, you look at the Big 12 rankings on 24-7 sports, 16th, Colorado. I'm shocked that there's 30, 30 Division One schools that are ranked lower than them in recruiting. Think about that. They got five guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's weird, man. Yeah. It's weird. You thought, hey, they're going to be able to use the, all the attention they got, all the coverage that they got in the 2023 season. They'll be able to take that to high school recruits. Tell those guys like, hey, people care about Colorado. Everyone's going to know who you are. Like you're going to be on ESPN and Fox, all this stuff. Because of Coach Prime, and apparently they just done none of that. I don't. It's it's oh, really I mean, weird to me, man. A lot of it makes it like if I was a high school kid, I wouldn't go to Colorado. 
the head coach pretty much in every interview says that he's going to replace pretty much everyone that he brings in. <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, if I'm a senior, okay, that may be somewhere where I go, but if I'm not, I feel like they're, I'm not going to get any opportunity. They're just going to go over the top of me in the transfer portal. Yeah. Just strange. Wild. How to capitalize on momentum when you got it. And if I was a Colorado fan, I'd just be looking around going, what, what's going on here? Yeah. Birthday shout outs. Welcome to the world. Evangeline Noel Lee Stringfellow. Nice. Welcome to the world, Harper Wren Haas. Welcome to the world, Laurel Ann Coon. Welcome to the world, Letty Burris. Man, listeners have been getting after it. Let's go. Burst left and right. Happy well, third. Happy third birthday to Aubrey Jackson. Happy seventh birthday to Rose Wiggins. Happy 14th birthday to Hannah Quinn V. Happy 15th birthday to Chloe Mishner. Mikener. Mikener. M I C H E N E R. Mitchener. Mikener. I don't know. One of those, right? It's got to be one of them. One of them. Happy 30th birthday to Taylor Crawford. Happy 42nd birthday to Will Melton. Happy 44th birthday to David Faulkner. Happy 49th birthday to Jeff Lienertz. Happy 60th birthday to primetime Patty Costner. And happy birthday to Harry James Taylor. H-J-T. Let's go. Love you, Harry. On that note, episode 381 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that will drop on Tuesday, right? Christmas is on Monday. I believe that's right. Yeah. So we're not doing Christmas Eve. We're not doing Christmas day. We'll record on Tuesday. That'll be our Alamo bowl preview. Yeah. turns out our buddy Cole Kublik is the busiest man on planet earth. So we may just have to do it solo. We'll figure which it I'm out. fine with. Have you watched every Arizona game? Uh, I haven't watched all of them. I've watched a good chunk. Yeah, I think I've watched like seven of them. So I think we're going to have a pretty good handle on. I think we can do the preview ourselves. I, I like <laughs> having the person Yeah, that can tell us more about the team. I, I like to gather stuff from that, but uh, we'll, we'll try to find someone. If we can't, then it is what it is. But just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on the ref. You can hear me from 2 to 5 on Sirius X and Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have an Awesome rest of your week. Have a fantastic weekend. Merry Christmas, everybody. Enjoy it. Don't get too stressed. Enjoy it. Until next time, we appreciate y'all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.